Welcome to 101. I'm Rick Kaplan, and my guest today is John Rufo. He's the principal at Form and Place, an architecture firm, architect firm. Uh, John, uh, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. So tell us a little bit about what Form and Place is all about. So we're a, uh, an architectural practice in our 10th year. Uh, we do architecture, urban planning, um, and urban design. And uh, we come from a kind of a long line of um, mixed use commercial development that over the years we've sort of spread out into um, doing a lot of work for uh, communities as well as for um, mixed use commercial developers. And so it's a pretty broad range of small projects to also larger um, mixed use master planning. And those two things tend to feed each other really nicely. Um, and so we, we love that real range of projects that we get involved in with, in the communities and with, our, with all of our clients, whether they're a community client or a, uh, or, a, or a private development company. Now, where do you focus most of your work? Is it, it just in New England or do you do work all over the country or the we world? <laughs> yeah, well, we are primarily in New England at this point. Um, do we have any projects outside of New England right now? It's a good question. I mean, we're registered in all six states of New England, um, but primarily we're here. Some of our clients have brought us to like Florida and New Jersey and New York um, in the past. I think right now, primarily we're working in, uh, in New England, but we, I feel like we can go anywhere, especially right now since everyone's working. <laughs> um, like everyone. Yeah. We, yeah, exactly. So, but primarily New England right now. So you have this thing that you call uh, collaborative visioning. Mm. Tell me a little bit about what collaborating, collaborative vi visioning is all about. Sure. Well, it's based on um, really the, the need and the emphasis of how we collaborate with our clients. We, we obviously collaborate internally, but as we talk about it as part of our business, it has to do more with how we collaborate with our clients. And it's sort of three-pronged. Um, it starts with what we call um, empathic programming, which is sort of a warm, fuzzy word like empathic and kind of a dry analytical word like programming. And we sort of put them together to get at the idea that listening to our clients and really understanding their needs as the first step is super critical to getting it right as we go. Um, and so that has, you know, that's sort of the idea of deep listening and whether it's the client or the community, that's really a, the critical first step. That feeds really quickly into the programming aspect of it, which is, um, you know, programming the project so that A, it meets our client's goals, B, it meets the community goals, which is critical. So again, sometimes the client's the community, sometimes the client's the developer. Um, but knowing that the programming and the way things work, especially on the ground plane of the project and how the interaction in the city or in the community or the village really works, that's a, that's a really critical part because the different programming elements have a lot to do with each other, the synergies and the energy that they create in any environment um, that we're designing. So that's that's sort of the second piece of it um, from the listening and programming. Um, then we head into uh, sort of a diagramming and sketching phase. Um, it's very iterative. You know, we try to have a lot of back and forth with our clients because I think the very first thing that they say, they're always adding nuance to it as they go. And the very first thing that we draw, we're always adding nuance to it as we go. So on a large scale, we tend to diagram a lot and establish hierarchies of streets or public plazas or buildings and we do that very loose, and then we tend to codify that diagramming after a certain point. At the same time, we're also sketching. So we're arriving at maybe some of the images on the back wall here that are final renderings, but early on, they're hand-drawn sketches, and they're trying to, right from the outset, give our clients a visual understanding of the ideas that we're talking about um, so that they can see what does this floor plan equal or what does this building elevation equal? How does it work in three dimensions? You know, most of our clients probably weren't trained as architects. That's why they need architects. So um, being able to visualize it really comes from our being able to draw it and visualize it for them. So that's the critical second step. And then from there, the third step is really just creating the, um, 
the final images that usually our clients then bring out to the public in a front of a planning board or in a community or that a community puts in front of a developer and says, see this vision for this street in the square, this is what you guys need to work to. So ultimately it's getting to the vision, but the iterative process to get there through programming, through, um, through, the, through the listening, through the sketching and diagramming, that sets everything up so that the vision can, kind of, can be on target at the end of the day. So you are saying that, you know, you, you get, you get to sit with the client, listen to what they're, uh, they're trying to describe to you mm -hmm. what they're looking for. And you have to try to extract exactly what their vision is. And then you put it down on a, a sketch for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really that direct, right? They, you know, our clients, they, they always know the site much better than we do because when they come to us they've already studied the site they know what the existing buildings can do and can't do they know what the community let's say market is like so they know what kind of tenants they're going to have if it's the community that we're working with like with the city of newton we've done where we work with them on a um on a peer review on call urban design basis like all these different entities they've been working with the site longer than we have and they know a lot about it in many, many levels. And we have to really listen to it to, to understand, okay, we can go and look at it. We're going to go and study it, but you know so much about it. Give us a brain dump and let us, let us understand what you know about it. So that's, that's really super critical. Yeah. So it, it, it avoids that process of you going to make the design and everything and then bringing it to them and then say, oh, well, no, I really didn't want that. I wasn't interested in doing this over here. And, you know, you, you already have an idea from listening to them what they are looking for. And you can go right to the, the to paper from that point. Yes. And, and hopefully, you know, it's not like we don't ever, you know, have a moment where the client says, you know, I don't think that's what we're looking for or the client <laughs> says. I, okay, I understand why you're drawing the building to look that way, but that's not really what we had in mind. So we like to, you know, we, we it's not like we stop listening and then we just go. At some point, you know, you gotta, you, you're gonna refine the vision because sure enough, clients have. Um, well, I, I'm, of, yeah, and I'm yeah. sure that eliminates a lot of the uh, trial and error type, uh, you know, designs that you're gonna probably prepare ahead of time. Yeah. It, it definitely, definitely helps. And to, to us, it's more troubling when a client wants to get to the answer a little too quickly. And because we're always a little suspicious that, oh, I can, you know, we can, we can give you something like right off the bat because Lord knows we do this all the time. However, it would be, it would be great if we went through a little bit more of an iterative, iterative process with you back and forth to get to something that's more evolved than something that just kind of landed on the page. So it's- Yeah, and I'm sure there's a lot of clients that, aren't really sure what they want. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's probably very difficult, especially when you're trying to extract that information and they have no idea really where they're going with it. And, and you have to now determine that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you make that first presentation and you have no idea if they're going to like it and they sit back and it's quiet for a few seconds and, and they say, I really love that. You go, whoo. I mean, you just, it's like the, you <laughs> feel the weight come off your shoulders or if they, or if they're looking at it, like, I don't understand what you're doing, then, you know, then, then it's back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, and, and, you know, right now with things changing, you know, especially with the pandemic and, yeah. uh, and also the new technology, uh, are you going through this process that I know so many in the industry are, uh, that you have to figure out new materials to make things a little more uh, streamlined, a little, uh, a, a little uh, labor intensive, uh, things like that. Yeah, I mean, from a, from a process standpoint with our clients, I think the um, well, it's interesting what it's forcing us to do because you can't have as many kind of organic face to face conversations with clients. Um, in which there's a, a lot gets drawn out in that dialogue, right? And we're all missing that right now in many ways. Um, even as we do it over Zoom like this, a lot, a lot isn't happening, the nuances of conversation, right? So what we're finding we have to do instead is actually be more scripted in how we 
present the work visually and how we present the work in the written words that go, <clears throat> excuse me, with explaining the work. Like that's really, we actually have to be better at that now than we were before because there was so much more an organic conversation with our clients prior. I think you could actually, unfortunately, you could get, you could develop some lazy habits in that you're going to just pick up the phone and talk to them about this or talk to them about that, or, you know, you're going to have them in the room and then the conversation will evolve. And if you don't have that, you, I, I feel like you've got to be a little bit more scripted, or at least we have found we had to be about how we present the work. So they see it, they look at it, they get on the call, and then the questions come. So it's, a, it's an interesting time for thinking about your verbal skills, your visualization skills, your writing skills, and how those all plug into the process. It's interesting that you say that because, you know, I, I would thought the opposite right now because of like the Zoom calls and these video conference calls that you could actually spend uh, more time with the client because they don't have to come into the office or you don't have to meet with them, you know, so you can do this at any time. You know, well, I think I think we do, especially, I think we spend more time on that, especially with our consultants and even our staff who we're all working remotely at the moment. Um, and I kind of feel like, well, whenever we get out of this, as everyone says, what do we go back to? And I feel like, well, being able to jump on a quick visual call with one of our consultants, like our structural engineer and MEP engineer, civil engineer, landscape architect, when we do that, I want to I want to do that much more frequently, like we're doing right now, right? I don't want to leave that behind. Like I think that's been a silver lining. It's like, hey, we can do this all the time, so let's do it all the time. It, I think that's important. But I find the client conversation, um, because they don't tend to quite speak our language as much, we've just got to be super intentional. Maybe it's a better word than scripted, but really intentional about how we present the work. Because I, again, I think certain parts of the dialogue and the conversation, the nuances are missed through a virtual call rather than we're all sitting around a conference table, we've all got our coffee and our scones and we're putting stuff up on the wall. That just tends to have a different result, I think. Than, than yeah, and I, and I can understand yeah. that because I, I, I do a lot of conferences. Well, I was doing a lot of conferences and yeah. I, I like that live audience because, you know, you have that... Uh, you have an instant interaction mm -hmm. right then and there, and you can you can respond to it much quicker. Where you don't know all the time what the interaction is going to be through video, right? And especially when you're trying to uh, be try to uh, drive everything to a, an audience, right? It's it right. makes it a little more difficult. Yeah. So I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, uh, and I love the name, Form in Place. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that name? I mean, it fits perfect. But. Yeah. So I would say back in early 2011, when we were inventing the firm, um, we were, uh, myself and my two partners, we were thinking about, um, you know, what are the, what are the things we do, right? So if you start with that, well, we design buildings, you know, and those, you can think of buildings in a number of different ways. Sometimes you might think of them as objects that you see in the distance. Sometimes you think of them as spaces that you inhabit. Um, so they have form inherently one way or another. You got to you got to build the wall. You got to put up the column, all that. But they also have a, this sense of place about them, whether it's the interior spaces or the place that is around the building, the placemaking that happens as part of any building as it sort of, as if you will, kind of pays its debt to the city around it, right? Um, hopefully it's, it's got good placemaking qualities just in the context of the site and how it catalyzes, like we were talking about programming, how it catalyzes the way people use the site. So to us, just stripping back the layers and thinking, well, what does the firm want to be about? Well, we know we're going to be making things and we know that we want those things to work well in the places that are around them, as well as work well as places unto themselves. And that's what we boiled it down to. At one point we were thinking about calling the company form place time because we're really interested in how places change over time. 
we decided to call that our blog that for a while, um, but we dropped the time because I don't know, it seemed maybe too esoteric or something, but that idea is still in there. We, we always think about how places go <laughs> over time, but we dropped the time eventually from our actual name. So your partners didn't go for the John Rufo Architects and Partners? No, no. <laughs> no, no. You know, we, in our, in our previous life, uh, the firms that we worked at were mostly firms that had place names not partner names. And we kind of like that too. We didn't want to make it, you know, Rufo, Wang, Manship, my, my two partners. Um, we we kind of wanted it to be about a place that could always evolve and expand and contract without actually having to throw out the name. So it made, it made the most sense. Well, I, I like the name because it's not the name of all the partners because, you know, I have all, I always have this issue when I'm trying to, figure out what kind of company some someone's with and yeah. it's just uh name three names is it an accounting firm is it an architectural firm? law is firm, it yeah. a law yeah. firm? you know i yeah. don't know so right. so this uh, this tells it right off the bat i like that yeah. Yeah. thanks good we, we like it we, we think it's a brand it seems to work for us so. so john if someone wants to uh find out more information about form in place or even about john rufo how do they get in touch with you well, right now, um, uh, the best thing to do is uh, there are a number of ways. I would say um, it's, well, there, I guess there are many ways. First of all, uh, look for us on social media and just reach out and get to us. You'll see us a lot on, uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and on Instagram. So that's a good way to track us and know a little bit more about what we're doing through what we're talking about. Um, next, I would say, you know, go to our website look us up, uh, email us and contact us, uh, that way. Um, the other way is, you know, if you've got a question about us, you know, um, you can just email me directly is the easiest thing to do, which is jrufo at formandplace.com. And, um, we're, we're happy to talk to you about, uh, about what's going on and I'm happy to listen. And, and what's your website? It's, um, it's just formandplace.com. That's all written out formandplace.com. So the and is A-N-D? The and is yeah. A-N-D, yeah. Okay. It's not the plus sign. That didn't seem to be the best idea in a URL to have that as a permanent thing. And it's not the ampersand, it's A-N-D. Perfect. Yeah. I, I appreciate the interview, John. It was uh, very much And I, I love the uh, style that you have to uh, work with your clients. Thank you for watching today's interview with John Rufo, Principal at Form and Place architects. If you want to contact John, you can reach him at 617-795-1965, or you can go to their website at formandplace.com. Again, the website is formandplace.com. I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal, and I thank you again for watching our interview.